Now that's the classical method. And we're not going to really do much with it other than talking about it like that. So basically you find a z-score and then you compare it to what you would expect. And you go, no, 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 no. 7.7 is way too large a z-score. And that's it. The method we're going to use all the time is the p-value method. P stands for probability. So this is the method that we are going to use. I wanted you to see the classical method because you may, you may hear it, you may see it in another class, and that way you kind of know what it's talking about. Um, but we're going to use the p-value method, which is the more modern method, and it's the method that's used more often. Um, Z-score method, the classical method, is classical because it's kind of older. Um, this is a method that was used um, before the invention of calculators. There are some people that still like it for a lot of very good reasons. It has a lot of things going for it, but we're going to shy away from that method and stick with the p-value method. All right, now what's the p-value method? Well, the p-value method is what's the probability of getting this result? I mean, if you're going to tell me by a sample is out that it could be a fluke, I want to know what the probability of that fluke is. Because if it's a low enough number, I'm going to go, no, I don't think so. I think it's this other thing, right? It's basically you're choosing between these two options. So when we did method one, classical method, we were basically saying, no, he's too far away for it to be a fluke. It's, he's too far, that's too, too many standard deviations away, it's going to be this one, this third option, the parameter's wrong. And in the p-value method, we're going to say, what's the probability of that result? So what's the probability of 12 fives in a row? Well, it's binomial, right? <laughs> we know how to do this. So the probability that x equals 12, it's been a while. Um, and we won't do binomial again. This is a nice review of binomial, though. Um, so if we do it on the calculator, it's second distribution, binom PDF. And I'll show you des um, not decimals. I'll show you stack crunch in just a second. We had 12 trials. The probability of success was 1 sixth, right? 1 divided by 6. And Steve got 12 fives. So paste. And that is the probability. It is 4.59, yada, 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 E negative 10. Notice that E back there, because that's scientific notation. If we look at it in StatCrunch, we would go to, oh, I have to open StatCrunch first. There it is. So we would go to Stat, Calculators, and you choose Binomial, which is second to the top, right? So you click Binomial. And then we would say n is 12, p was 1 sixth, which, oh, I should get a decimal for that. I don't think it'll take 1 divided by 6 in here. I think I need the decimal. And then I want the probability that x equals 12. Oh, it did take 1 sixth. Oh, look at that. Nice. And there you can see 4.59e negative 10. It's so small, it's off the screen because there's no dots to even draw. So there you go. All right, so this is, that decimal moves 10 spots over to the left. So if I put the 4, 5, 9 here, I'd move that decimal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 spots. And that would be zeros for every empty space. That is extremely small, right? So you'd be saying, look, the probability of a fluke, because that's what you just found. This is the probability of a fluke. That is so, 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 so low that we don't think it's a fluke. We think it's the parameter is wrong. If I can spell the word parameter. Right? So we think it's so low that we think it's not a fluke and the parameter is wrong. In other words, both of these methods are leading to the conclusion that the parameter is wrong, but they're doing it in different ways. Now, is it possible that there was somebody in the room that did not have a five on their die? 
And the answer is yes, as a matter of fact. So I have often done this in class and there are times occasionally, and not this particular one, there's another die that is one, two, three, one, two, three that I have. And sometimes I'll give it to the students and they don't even realize their die is weighted. <laughs> they don't realize that they, they rolled no fives because they actually had a die that was, um, had no fives on it. Oh, and by the way, the die that um, Steve, quote unquote, is rolling is a die that's all fives. And of course, that's because in craps, this die is nothing but fives. Five, 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 every single side. And in craps, if you roll these, you win you win, right? You win if you roll seven or 11, which is all you'll ever roll on these two dice. So that's, they're fun. Um, you wouldn't be able to walk into a casino with them. They're not even, they don't even remotely look like casino dice. So they're just more for fun. You can find them online, right? Okay, so the answer to this is absolutely yes, right? It is possible um, and it actually often happens. Sometimes the student doesn't even realize it, that they have it. So yes, that student is among the zeros. So um, a student with no fives would be among the zero results. Oop. There we go. All right. Now, how would we spot them? Well, you actually can't spot them in our current data. But you could spot them if you made them roll more. Right? If we make the class roll more, then all the people that had no fives will eventually get a five, except for whoever has this die, because there's no fives to be had. So Steve will be spotted from a mile away because, you know, even in a small data set, you'll know that that one's unusual. But this one is not unusual right now. That's why you don't spot them. That's why that student sometimes doesn't even know that they have a loaded die, right? Because they're not an unusual result. But if I made them roll 100 times, this would be the only person at zero. This would be the only person at 100. And everybody else would be in the middle, right? Make the class roll. it will become more obvious, right? If I made the class roll a hundred times, both the zero and the, both of these dice would become very obvious, right? So this one would be a hundred, this one would be zero, but no other student with a normal die would be either of those things, right? So all the rest of the students would end up being all sorts of different numbers, but the student with no fives will become, a, will stay at zero no matter what. And the student with 12 fives will turn into a student with 100 fives because all they're going to get is fives, right? All right, so what, where am I going with this? Well, keep this in mind for the rest of the, of the course. When you're making a hypothesis test, you're choosing between fluke and parameter wrong because bias sample is kind of out, right? In real life, it can happen, but we can't deal with it. So we're going to go with fluke or parameter wrong. There's two main methods for proving it. They're far away from the rest of the group. That's the method we won't use very often, actually, ever. And then the probability of what they got, the probability of that fluke is so low that we don't think it's a fluke. We think it's the parameter is wrong. And keep in mind, we can only prove what we have evidence for. That's the moral of this story. And proving is, is a word that I don't even want to say. So we can only support what we have evidence for. How about that? We don't really prove stuff anyway because it's still a possibility it's a bias sample of other things. So we can only support what we have evidence for. Everything we do has to be based on evidence. So if you don't have evidence of that student with the zero dot or the zero fives, then you can't call them out because you don't have enough evidence to prove it. 